Welcome to the Moonshots Podcast. It's episode 139. I'm your co-host, Mike Parsons. And as always, I'm joined by the man with a plan, the man with the models of the day, Mr. Mark Pearson Frillin. Good morning, Mark. Hey, good morning, Mike. What an exciting day we've got ahead of ourselves uh, as we continue this mental model series. I know we are like knee deep in mental model mayhem. Mark, where are we and where are we going to? We're going to find light through the uh, the mad uh, forest of mental models as we surround ourselves with all these different frameworks. We're going to go to the man who has the light and the shining torch to cut us through this forest. It's Mr. Charlie Munger. And wow, Mike, what an individual who's seen so much success and so much activity throughout his 97 years. Yes, I would say he clearly qualifies as a living legend. He is uh, none other than uh, the consigliere, the Robin to the Batman. He is none other than Warren Buffett's business partner. Uh, They run Berkshire Hathaway. And if none of that rings any bells, Mark, I think we can put this into a little bit of context. Tell us about Berkshire Hathaway. They are just an enormous <laughs> spread of companies, actually, Mike. So let me let me hit you with some stats, with some data. Berkshire Hathaway have a market value of over six hundred and twenty billion US dollars, and they wholly own as well as have significant stakes in some of the largest and most well-known household brands in the world. Mm. So let me hit you with just a couple, Mike, and see, uh, tell me if you've heard of any of these. (laughs) So some of the wholly owned companies that they have include Geico, Duracell, Cavalier Homes. Some of the companies they have significant stakes in are perhaps even more well-known. Apple, IBM, American Express, Southwest Airlines, United Airlines. I mean, this is a company that has huge, you know, fingers in all of the different pies of some of the most well-known brands in the world. Pretty amazing stuff. And what's crazy to think is that Munger, together with Warren Buffett, built Berkshire Hathaway from nothing. And um, I think what is even more amazing Yes, in the companies that they wholly own, there's like over 300,000 employees. But, you know, you think about it, Berkshire Hathaway, $624 billion, 14th largest company worldwide by revenue. How many people, Mark, are in their head office? Well, Mike, I'm not going to lie to our listeners, but we could probably get all of the employees of Berkshire Hathaway into one room for dinner. The latest number that we could find was 25 individuals, including Mr. Charlie Munger. So we just need to put that in a little bit of context. They built this from scratch, 14th biggest company by revenue. And in the head office, they do all of this with just a whopping 25 employees. This is someone that we can learn from. I'm sure in order to achieve this, there are some mental models, Mark. What do you think? Uh, there's got to be mental models, you know, much like with Albert Einstein that we covered in show 137, Shane Parrish last week, Mike, in 138. We're gradually building this lattice works of, of mental models. And Charlie Munger has a few to share with us today as well. He does indeed. Um, so get set. We have done such a spread so far. We have done the classic, you know, the king of the hill. Albert Einstein and learned his mental models. We've gone to the latest and sort of the pioneering work of Shane Parrish, where he's brought it all together in his mental models guide, his toolbox. And today we go to the living legend of Charlie Munger himself. And if you want to make great decisions, it's all about mental models and mental models is something you need to acquire. And we have got some great advice from Munger himself, where he's giving USC's law commencement speech. And he's going to talk about what we need to think about, what is essential for a lifetime of learning. It's not something you do just to advance in life. Wisdom acquisition is a moral duty. And And there's a corollary to that proposition, which is very important. It means that you're hooked for lifetime learning. 
And without lifetime learning, you people are not going to do very well. You are not going to get very far in life based on what you already know. You're going to advance in life by what you're going to learn after you leave here. If you take Berkshire Hathaway, which is certainly one of the best regarded corporations in the world, and it may have the best invest long-term investment record in the entire history of civilization. The skill that got Berkshire through one decade would not have sufficed to get it through the next decade with the uh, achievements made. Without Warren Buffett being a learning machine, continuous learning machine, the record would have been absolutely impossible. The same is true at lower walks of life. I constantly see people rise in life who were not the smartest, sometimes not even the most diligent, but they are learning machines. They go to bed every night a little wiser than they were when they got up. And boy, does that habit help, particularly when you have a long uh, run ahead of you. Alfred North Whitehead said at one time that the rapid advance of civilization came only when man invented the method of invention. And of course, he was referring to the huge growth in GB. GDP per capita and all the other good things that we now take for granted, which happened just started a few hundred years ago, and when before that all was stasis. And uh, so, if, if if civilization can progress only when it invents the method of invention, you can progress only when you learn the method of learning. I was very lucky. I came to law school having learned the method of learning. And, uh, and nothing has served me better in my long life than continuous learning. And if you take Warren Buffett, if you watched him with a time clock, I would say half of all the time that he spends is just sitting on his ass and reading. And a big chunk of the rest of the time is spent talking one-on-one, -on -one, either on the telephone or personally, with highly gifted people whom he trusts and who trust him. In other words, it looks quite academic, all this worldly success. I mean, Mike, what a clip to get us started with Mr. Charlie Munger recounting some of the tips and advice that he's used within Berkshire Hathaway, as well as Mr. Warren Buffett. I mean, one big idea is, is revealed to me here, Mike, and that's the idea or the realization that you won't get through decade two with the same thinking that you used in decade one. You have to learn, mm. adapt, and change. And I think that's a really a penny drop moment for me because without, uh, imagine just going straight out of school and trying to live the, the rest of your life using the same things that you learned in school, that you're going to always reach a, a certain point and never be able to go beyond that boundary. Yeah. Like a I plateau, think, right? Like a plateau, exactly. Mm. And, and I think this is a really valuable call out and lesson that Munger is sharing with us straight away. Without having the ability to learn and to improve your maybe horizons or, or just change the way that you think about things, you're always going to reach that plateau pretty, pretty darn fast. Mm. And, and that's, that's a great first lesson, isn't it? Yeah. You can't, you know, uh, sit on your laurels, right? You have to continually reinvent yourself. And, and what was interesting he was pointing out is the lessons of one decade would not work in the following decade. And he should know because him and Warren have been at Berkshire for five decades. So yes. I think when we talk about legacy and talk about longevity of the work and the contribution that you make, I think what he makes a very powerful argument for is continuous learning. You have to have a voracious appetite for the new, be curious, right? Um, and I think what you just pointed out, Mark, that's why you've got to keep learning because if you get stale, 
you know, you're going to find that the tool set is that you have, the way you think, will become outdated. It eventually will no longer work. I mean, I'm going to show my age here, but I grew up as a kid with no internet, right? And so radically what we have seen is executives like myself that learnt traditional media technology and business rules have had to relearn everything because the internet has changed everything about how we live and work. So we always have these moments of things around us that change the context. Think about the invention of the telephone, the jumbo jet, et cetera, et cetera. These are all massive. The iPhone, uh, I mean, that is, that's huge. Think about what AI machine learning is going to do. These are going to change paradigms. Let's get practical, Mark. Another reason to learn is we're now all deeply entrenched in hybrid ways of working or maybe for some fully remote working, which was unthinkable even five years ago. Unthinkable, right? Yep. Totally unthinkable and totally, um, for some businesses, they were unprepared, right? They, they didn't think it would ever happen, so they didn't want to learn how to roll it out internally or uh, learn about new systems and processes and tools to make it happen. So everybody was kind of caught off guard because I think they were using the same lessons that they'd operated under for the last decade. Yes, so I want you to think what we have with Charlie Munger is somebody who has seen so many different eras, chapters in the way in which we work and their company, what Warren Buffett and Charlie have built in Berkshire Hathaway is something that has outperformed year on year, decade upon decade. That's what we can learn in this show. So Mark, I'm fired up. I I just want to know what's next in our adventure into the world of Charlie Bunga. Well, before we start learning from Charlie and understanding some of the models that he uses to not only learn, but also to think different. We've got a quick introduction from Swedish investor talking about Charlie's mind. And this clip's great at revealing some of the approaches that Charlie has as we consider mental models. So this next clip we're going to hear from Mike is Swedish investor talking about Charlie's thinking tools. An advertisement for a company called Warner and Swayze used to say, The company that needs a new machine tool and hasn't bought it is already paying for it. Charlie Munger, the vice chairman of Berkshire Hathaway and one of the most successful investors in the world, says that this applies to thinking tools as well. The man who is in need of a new thinking tool but hasn't yet acquired it is already paying for it. It's extraordinary how resistant some people are learning anything. Warren Buffett has said the following about Charlie Munger. Charlie has the best 30-second mind in the world. He goes from A to Z in one move. He sees the essence of everything before you can even finish the sentence. How does he do it? Through observing reality and running it against his mental models. These mental models have helped Munger to conquer the stock market, but they are so diverse that they have applications within many other areas too. For example, they have allowed Munger to be a successful chairman at a large hospital, and they have allowed him to overcome devastating personal losses. So there you go. Um, It is learning at the heart but it is being ready to deploy a whole suite of mental models to whatever problem comes up. To me, this is the next step. Once you say, all right, we've got to have mental models, right? You've got to think properly. You've got to think about thinking. So then an event happens and then you actually have a tool set in front of you and like which tool is appropriate for the task. Whilst this might sound simple to say, Once you realize what's on offer, Mark, there is so many different options and models. I mean, it's very exciting, but it's also, it's quite cathartic to realize, well, you know, chances are people in the world have thought about most problems that have happened. There's probably a go-to way to think about it. You've just got to have the right model for the right moment. And that's going to be something that would have been consistent for Albert Einstein, Uh, for Shane Parrish, as we heard last week, as well as Charlie Munger. How do I know which tool is is right for me? And the only way I think 
that you're going to be able to distinguish and determine which one's right is to follow the Charlie Munger approach, which is to become a learning machine, to adapt your your business as well as your approach to problems uh, decade by decade or uh, situation by situation, and trial different thinking frameworks. Mm. Think, okay, well, if I am trying to solve this particular problem, let's let's go through my catalog, my mental catalog of different approaches and see which one might work. And I think you can only do that once you've built up, like Charlie would say, a repertoire of thinking tools that then enable him to choose the right one when he gets to that problem. Yeah, and just for some fun, you know, I've made a little um, uh, index of some of my favorite uh, mental models, Mark. I mean, we can't fit all the mental models into this series. I mean, it's going to be a four-show series, Mark. We've done Einstein. We've done Shane Parrish. You know, we're jamming on uh, Charlie Munger. We're going to do Peter Holland's. But I've just got, this is how many options and there are for us to think better. And so I'm just going to give you a list of some of my favorite. Okay. Circle of competence, circle of influence, inversion, full att- uh, attribution error, Hamlin's razor, opportunity costs, Pareto principle, preference attachment, redundancy, margin of safety, first principles, thought experiments, second level thinking, and the list goes on. These are all different models we can use for different problems. I mean, how cool is that? Like literally any problem we're encountering, it's very likely that the answer lays in that list that I just read out. I mean, these are the probably the top 20 or so most common one. So hopefully like it's 50, 60% of problems will probably be answered by thinking along these lines. I mean, that is pretty cool, isn't it? Well, I, I think that's the aha moment as we dug into these mental models and listeners, you can go back to our Einstein show, uh, show 137. If you want to hear more about thought experiments, probabilistic thinking, Occam's razor, you can go into the Shane Parrish episode for circular competence, first principles, second order thinking and inversion. I mean, Mike, woof, we've covered a handful already, but mm-hmm. I think without being able to dig into each of these and without hearing from these individuals such as Charlie Munger, who have utilized these mental frameworks in their approach to problem solving, it's very easy for us to fall into the trap of just thinking, well, I'll figure it out. I'll think off my cuff. I'll make it up as I go along, as opposed to taking a step back and a pause. And instead of jumping onto the fire, thinking, okay, well, maybe there is something out there that can help me. Maybe there is a situation that somebody else has faced that is somewhat similar to mine. And Mm. what did they learn? And this idea of learning from the mental models or the mistakes you could say of, of, of other people and being inspired by somebody like Einstein, who's going out very focused in a physics and mathematical way that's quite unique or niche compared to what you and I might do. But the fact that we can still take those mental model frameworks and utilize them in our work, in our worlds, which are mm. much more technologically uh, uh, unique versus Einstein, and still benefit from them. I mean, it, it's just pretty confronting when you when you think, why not utilize a lot of this thinking in my day-to-day practice? It, you know, you, you don't want to waste it. It all exists. <laughs> yes. And the good news, Mark, just as we're both in awe of this massive inventory of mental models that we might choose to use, here's the good news. Um, I know somewhere that will guide us through it all, and it's Moonshots. .io, Mark, I think is that just not the place to go? If you want to get the, to the bottom, not only of thinking better, but improving yourself and leading others, I can think of no better place than moonshots.io. What about you, Mark? Yeah, pop along, listeners, to moonshots.io. You can find all of our series on mental models and thinking better. You can go through our back catalog of 139 shows, Mike. Whew, that's a lot of learning, isn't it? That's good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You've got There's a trans- lot of- <laughs> Yeah. There's a lot of learning there, and um, it's not just, you know, us announcing shows, is it, Mark? There's a whole lot more than that. 
there's so many utensils and tools to help us all learn out loud together. We've got transcripts, we've got frameworks, we've got reading lists, show notes for all of our shows, 139 shows. And Mike is even a special area for those who want to go that extra mile with their learning and become subscribers, don't they? Mm. And you look, we want you to become a member because by you becoming a member of the Moonshots uh, podcast, you give us the ability to build things like the mobile app that we're working on. You give us the ability to pay for all the hosting and production, and it's a way for us to contribute more to you, our listeners. It's a way for us to build something that will stand the test of time, just like Berkshire Hathaway. So we really encourage you to go over to moonshots.io, click on the members button, jump in, become a member. We've got a special thank, uh, thank you, Mark. We've got a couple of members who've become patrons and members of Moonshots. Who, who are those lucky self-learners, those moonshotters? Our three um, listeners of the week and special shout outs go to Miss Jess, Nils and Mr. Bob, our three Patreons or three of our Patreons who we want to give special shout outs to. Yeah, really appreciate your support. Your support of us is going to help us build this mobile app to deploy more shows and more goodies. And as a member, Mark, we, we, we can't forget this, you get access to our exclusive Moonshot Master Series where we recently did a deep dive, a 90-minute deep dive into motivation where there was all of the tools and the experts. We handpicked the very best thinking, inspiration, and tools for you to learn how to keep getting motivated. It's a bit like mental models. you got to keep working on your learning and like learning, you got to keep working on your motivation. And the next one we're working on is going to be on first principles thinking, which is a really powerful mental model uh, showcased by Peter Thiel and a little uh, innovator called Elon Musk. That's the next um, Moonshot Master Series. You can get that if you become a member. It's strictly members only. So jump over to moonshots.io and give us some love. Be part of the team. Become a moonshotter. And uh, Mark, we got a few shout outs um, over the last day or two. I think we should, uh, um, you know, give a few shout outs to a couple of listeners who were saying some very nice things and sharing their love for improving themselves, right? Yeah. A special shout out to Jessica Cox, who got in touch with us and left a very, very kind uh, note. We're so glad that you've started listening and we really appreciate the, the fact that you're finding so much value in the discussions that we're having, not only between myself and Mike, but listeners, we're having discussions with you guys as well. And we love hearing from you when you get in touch with us, as well as Mike, not only via email and via moonshots.io, but on LinkedIn. And a special shout out to Julian and Ronnie, who recently gave us a little bit of love and had a discussion amongst themselves and their followers on the Moonshots podcast. And Mike, there was a special mention from Ronnie where he's refining his mental models. And that just seems like the perfect segue back into our show on Charlie Munger. Yeah. I mean, he's in the right place at the right time. Shout out to you, Ronnie. Thanks for all your support. Let's pick up again with Mr. Charlie Munger and let's learn about the method of learning. Charles H. from New York. Uh, he actually quotes a speech that you gave, a commencement address you gave in 2007 at USC Law School. I'll paraphrase here. You wrote, or uh, you said, so if a civilization can progress only when it invents the method of invention, you can only progress when you learn the method of learning. I was very lucky. I came to law school having learned the method of learning, and nothing has served me better in my long life than continuous learning. Charles H. would like to know, what's Charlie's method of learning? Well, I think I had the right temperament. And when people gave me a good idea and I could see it was a good idea, I quickly mastered it and started using it and he just used it for the rest of my life. And you say that everybody does that in their education, but I don't think everybody does. It's such a simple idea. And of course, without the method of learning, you're like a one-legged man in an ass-kicking contest. It's just not gonna work very well. Take Jerry 
You think the Daily Journal would have hundreds of millions of marketable securities now if Jerry didn't know how to learn something new? He didn't know one damn thing about the Daily Journal when we made him head of it, but he knew how to learn what he didn't know. Of course, that's a useful thing. And by the way, I think it's hard to teach. I think it's to some extent you either have it or you don't. Well, Jerry Next. Chang would like to know. Uh, Jerry, Jerry Chang would like to know uh, why are some people incapable of learning new ideas and behaviors? Well, it's partly culture, but I, I, a lot of it's just born in. It's a quirk. Some people have a a, a natural trend toward good judgment, and other people do just make their life is just a series of mistakes over and over again. I mean, Mike, this is telling me temperament. It's telling me attitude. It's teaching me you've got to have the element of practice. Mm -hmm. Not only can you read something or learn from another individual, but to actually compartmentalize it and to use it or apply it, that's how you know whether you've understood it correctly, right? And how you know if it's going to work in your particular problem. This idea of practicing the mental models, I think, is a really key shout out mm. from Charlie. Yeah, I think we've made the case, obviously, you know, learning the method of learning, thinking about thinking is essential. If you want to create, you know, Munger's success in Berkshire Hathaway, if you want to, you know, emulate the likes of Elon Musk, you got to have your thinking together. What I think you know, you talked to earlier on one of the clips about the penny dropping for me is he's like, you've got to apply it, right? You can't just, it's like, if you're watching YouTube all the time about how to work out, but you actually never have a go at working out, um, you're never going to grow, but you know, be very practical. Let's say you get some gym workout on YouTube and then you, you watch it and then you go to apply it. And then you're like, well, hang on, pause. How did they do that? Rewind. And then you try and you try it's only then that you're really getting it, right? Just watching YouTube, uh-uh. You gotta you gotta practice that workout. And often it can take weeks and months to learn something new and to make it a habit. What he's telling us is continuous learning has to be applied learning. And he made a little reference in that clip to the hardest thing is to teach. And there's this great wisdom that if you want to learn something, you should teach something. So my question for you, Mark, is how, how, where do you go to when you want to learn something new, when you want to learn how to think differently, where do you go? Well, it, it's, I'm glad you asked, Mike, because I think this requires a little bit of reflection, doesn't it? And mm. I think in order to learn correctly, you need to understand the best way for you as an individual to learn because we all learn in different ways. Sometimes it's quite easy for an individual. And I went to school with these people. They just have to sit in a classroom. They could be scribbling on the desk, but somehow they just retain everything that they hear. Did you, did you have anybody or were you one of those people? Uh, no, I was far from <laughs> one of those people. I did not, uh, yeah. engage, uh, enough. I did not retain enough uh, and I didn't really sort myself out until well after high school. But uh, yeah, you've got to apply it, right? You've really yeah, got to have a go. Exactly. That's exactly how, how our, uh, myself, uh, I needed to, to learn. I needed to put things into action. I needed to understand maybe a bit about um, photosynthesis through experimentation. So seeing how it might work or at least watching something or someone demonstrate how it works by really breaking it down into a kind of molecular level. That's how I would learn. And then building on that, maybe doing it myself. And I, I think that this is quite consistent with how I've learned new skills through my career as well. Mm. When somebody breaks it down, maybe it's through a video format, maybe it's through an online course, or maybe it's through a big old whiteboard and somebody just drawing something up. By then, compartmentalizing that, understanding how it works, and then physically repeating it myself. That's how I personally learn. I mean, there's many other ways that you can learn from others. You can interact with them. You can just read online. You can mm. perhaps go out and see somebody talk or watch something like a, like a USC commencement law speech from Charlie Munger, for example. 
I think for me, this is all about putting it into practice. And that's where Charlie's really calling it out as well. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the, one of the things I do, um, it's similar to you, Mark, like I'm, I'm going out there, I'm trying to apply it. Um, I love to read, but where I find the best thing, where the aha moment for me is when I'm, uh, writing it down and then trying to write examples, applying it, um, using it in my work. Um, and you know, if I don't write it down and apply it, I think I retain maybe 10% of the idea. Mm. That's all. So until, you know, you say to me, like someone comes to me and talks about building a product, I still, to this day, deliberately use models like the lean hypothesis, design thinking um, tools such as a user journey, user personas, to keep coming back to these tools to apply to a problem. And what I, what I really want to implore to you and to our audience, Mark, is if you write it down, if you uh, publish a blog post on it, share your learnings, whatever it takes, make a video, share it with your colleagues. If you transform what someone says to you or what you listen to read, if you write it down, repackage it, and then put it back out in the world, this for me was the big uh aha about how I learn. So under that process, I will retain more than 80% of the idea. However, if I just, for example, watch a YouTube video, Mm. give me a week, I've retained less than 10% of the idea. Yep. So until I apply in that process where I write it down, decode it, repackage it, put it back together, and then put it back out in the world. If I don't do that by working with others, by reading, thinking it through, experimenting, you know, trying, and maybe I mess it up, who cares? If I don't do that, then I'm not learning. Does that, ha- does that make sense? So how would you say if you need to get to an 80 plus retention rate on the idea to learn a model, an idea, a way of thinking, is it similar for you? Or where does it yeah. does it get a bit different? I, th- I think I'm definitely a, a a scribbler as well. I'll write lots of notes as we're um, conducting our podcast. Even our listeners will be pleased to hear that I've got lots of notes in front of me right now. <laughs> uh, and I'll do that in my career, anything that I'm trying to re- learn or retain or or reflect later. And what I would do is I'll, I'll write it down, mm-hmm. and maybe I'll share those notes, or maybe I'll just hold on to them. But by verbalizing them by almost uh, kind of like reading a script, I suppose. Maybe we were uh, learning to put on a play mic. Maybe you and I will do some kind of theater performance when, when lockdown eases. By presenting it to somebody else or voicing it out loud, that, that helps me. It's, it's almost the con- conference or, or you know, the movement from it being written down, coming through my ears as well. It, it's yeah. a whole multi-stimulus um, yes. effort that helps me learn, yeah. You've got to kick it, shake it, roll around in it, use it, <laughs> dress it up, and and really be in it. I, you know, you just reminded me of another example I have. Okay, so I read book summaries a lot. So I get uh, in my newsfeed a lot of book summaries, and whenever I see something that appeals to me, I might read the book summary. Let's say... I look at, uh, in a month, I, I look at perhaps, I don't know, 10 book summaries. Maybe one of these or two of these, I will listen to the audio book. But here's what's really interesting. So I'm running and I'm listening to a, a book. At the moment, I'm listening to Kaizen, which is a book about this Japanese philosophy of continuous self-improvement. And um, what I do is when the author, uh, I want to say it's Robert Maura, if I can remember it correctly. So let's say he's talking about something. There are these um, six ways to do continuous uh, uh, learning. And I heard this on Saturday, so a few days ago. And I was like, oh my gosh, he just did this great breakdown of the six parts of continuous self-improvement. So while I'm running, I will usually do one of two things. I do a voice note to myself 
that I pick up later and I'll, I'll tell you what I do with it. But in this case, it was so good that as I ran by the river, I opened up my phone. I kept running. It sounds a bit ridiculous. I was totally safe. No one got harmed in this. Um, and I went into my Kindle app while jogging rather slowly, found the segment and highlighted the segment because it was so big for me. It was so profound. And then wait for this. So I went and highlighted that thing, put my phone back in and kept running. The following day, I in, when I was sitting down to do some journaling, I went back and got these six items out of my Kindle highlights and I wrote about them because they were so important to me. It was really clicked with how I'm thinking at the moment. I was like, yeah, that's fantastic. Now, here's the thing. How many times, Mark, do you read a book or listen to a book and go, oh, wow, that's a good thought? Does that happen much? It happens a lot. Right? Yep. Like the, yep. the author is saying something and you're like, yes, right? But what I've learned about myself is a week later, if I haven't done that process I just described to you, a week later, if you ask me what were the good things in uh, the, the book about Kaizen, I'd go, um, hang on, yeah. there was a thing, I can't remember exactly, but it was kind of this. But now if you ask me that question, what's good? Well, I can say in chapter two, he mentions the six key practices of continuous learning, asking small questions, having small thoughts, et cetera, et cetera. The point is because I went and highlighted it and then wrote about it in my journal, that act has transformed how much I've retained. I've instantly gone from 10 to an 80% recall because I learned the method. And this is figuring out how you do it. What I'm suggesting to you and to all of our listeners, figure out how you can digest it. This is not a casual couch sport. Learning is an active sport. And you've really got to jump in and find whatever practice you need to learn. But don't just be sitting on the couch and let all this good thinking go past you. I think for me, that's so essential in adopting this, isn't it, Mark? Oh, I, I, I like that uh, reference about learning. It's not a casual casual couch. Was that the, the terminology? It's, yeah, it's, it's, you, know, you don't do it on like the couch. That. You get out on the field and you play, right? You got to yeah, do it. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. And as we reflect on these different meta models, Mike, and these elements of, of learning, I mean, the truth is everybody's going to have that different approach. And likewise, everybody's going to have different mental tools that they can apply in their day-to-day -day life. And this next clip, Mike, from Swedish Investor breaks down another piece of Charlie's wisdom and how you need all these different tools for life's uh, plethora of situations. And this next clip we're going to hear about is how to become a Swiss army knife. If you're going to learn how to drive a car, you understand that it isn't enough to only learn how to use the accelerator. In fact, only learning how to use the accelerator when driving a car pretty much guarantees that you will hurt yourself and others. You need to learn about multiple things. How to use the steering wheel, the brakes, the rear view mirror, the gear shift, how to interpret road signs, how to honk on people when they do stupid things that you would never do because you're an above average driver, etc. Now, the world is of course a lot more complex than a car. If you want to become a successful thinker in such a world, you need to learn about many different ideas. Charlie Munger calls this worldly wisdom. He estimates that he's got about 100 mental models in his head, which he uses regularly. No need to get overwhelmed though, because he also says that you don't have to know everything. A few of the really big ideas carry most of the fright. By definition, this is going to be a game which you play with multiple techniques and multiple models, and a lot of experience is very helpful. Here's another analogy. To the man with a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. The man with a hammer is paying for his ignorance, because he will torture reality to fit the only model that he knows about. And of course this is a stupid way of behaving, because it is not the world itself that will change. It's the man with the hammer who will fall on his face. You'd rather be like the man with a Swiss army knife. The man with a Swiss army knife realizes that 
different problems require different tools, and he's equipped and ready for applying the best tool for the given situation. Yeah, different problems, different uh, solutions. You can't just think of the world as you being a hammer and everything's a nail mark. I think this is the next big thing, right? So we've we've understood the importance of learning. We've understood the importance of having the ability to learn how to learn, how to think, how to think. But now what we're getting from Charlie Munger's work is the essence of it is you've got to have a multiple set of models so that you can apply the right model in the right time. That's why I've got this big list. I haven't quite worked out which are my favorite ones, Mark, but I think this journey just keeps evolving. Like you got to think about thinking, you got to continuously learn, but now it's about deploying the right model at the right time. And to just to remind you, we had Occam's razor, um, from uh, Einstein. We had from Shane Parrish, inversion, first principles, second order thinking, circle of competence. And now we're building the case that you've got to have all of these. You've got to be familiar with these. You've got to know when to deploy them. I, I think the job here, the call to action here is working out what kind of models work best for you in your work, in your life. I think this is a very interesting and a little bit challenging of a question. What do you think, Mark? Yeah, I I think I now appreciate and understand the need for mental models. I think that analogy we just heard with the Swiss army knife versus the man with the hammer is a really good one. Don't torture reality by trying to make reality fit around you. Remember that you can adapt easier than the problem or the situation, you know, by using different mental models. And I I think, Mike, though, we have stumbled upon the the potential problem, isn't it? How do you know which one to apply? Mm. And I suspect the answer that Albert Einstein, Shane Parrish, and maybe even Charlie Munger would tell us is to apply it and see, to experiment and test it. That's right. That's right. And I think that in general, the, the way to think about it is that there are mental models if you have to make a decision, like, do we go left or right? Then there's like, okay, we've got a problem. How do we fix it? And then the other one is like, how do we design like a new system? And systems thinking and systems design is something that we've talked about before, but that's loosely the three buckets. So Mark, let me ask you this question. In your line of work, do you tend to have to think more about problem solving, decision making, or systems thinking? I think it's going to be more um, of the former, actually. I think it's all about trying to, and and one of the great mental models that we've covered on the show that really stood out to me was the idea of inversion. So starting with the end result and trying to work backwards and think, okay, well, what obstacles might we run into? Is it going to be dependencies? Is it going to be um, challenges from... Uh, teams or time zones mm-hmm. or whatever it might be, mm-hmm. and trying to systematically work through those backwards in order to find uh, the right way of working on it now. Gotcha. Um, so what that, you're what you're saying, you're, the answer you're giving is you're saying you're largely in the problem solving category. You, most of your work, I think so. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. now, what's interesting is so you've said inversion. Uh, sorry. Um, which one did you say again? Inversion. Yep. You were, yeah, you did say inversion. Gosh, I'm, I'm already like <laughs> jumping off to these other models. What am I doing? So inversion. So this is all about, you know, solving a problem from a different point of view. Very, very powerful. So let's just say that for you and, and for our listeners, maybe a lot of your work is in the problem solving area. And I would say that this is perhaps one of the, the more popular areas of mental models. The other thing you can do is look at first principles. And we're going to do a whole master series on first principles. That's breaking down complex, uh, very complex situations into very fundamental, simple, uh, basic elements or truths. That's first principles. Now, Mark, another thing that might be interesting for you is this idea of, um, it's called an, wait for it, Ishikawa diagram. And that's how you just get to the source of a problem or, or what some might call getting to the root causes. So you map 
the problem and then go backwards of that saying, well, why did that happen? And you list all the contributing factors. So you're not even actually in solution territory yet. In order to make, uh, you know, some headway, you're actually going deep into what is the problem and why. Yes, I'm aware or, or semi-familiar with the Ishikawa diagram because it, it's, it looks a little bit like a fish, doesn't it? <laughs> I, listen, it can look like it, whatever works. If you're getting whatever to the works. root cause, whatever works. But these are, these are all problem-solving um, models. Now, just quickly, let's just give some examples of decision-making. Now, for, for me, what's really interesting, if you look at someone in um, the financial markets, that's someone, someone who's making uh, investments, be it professionally or, or personally, um, there's some really interesting decisions. So you, uh, models you can use, you might have what we call second order thinking, where you go more into the consequences of, okay, so I think I should do this, but what would actually happen? What would be the consequence of me doing that? So second order thinking. Now, another big decision that we all have to make is how we spend our time, right? Mm, huge. Now, something I've mentioned a lot on this show is a mental model for decision-making about how you spend your time, which is called the Eisenhower matrix. Do you remember the Eisenhower matrix, Mark? I do, Mike. We've, we've discussed a couple of times, uh, probably back in our, I want to say maybe the, even the habit forming um, series that we were digging into, wasn't it? Exactly. Around how to decide what to schedule and what to focus on. Yes. And so the heart of this mental model is weighing up the importance versus the urgency of an activity. And um, I really encourage you and all of our listeners, double, triple, quadruple dive into Eisenhower Matrix, weighing up importance versus urgency. It's a fantastic model to use. And that is kind of loosely classified as a decision-making mental model. What we talked about earlier was more about problem solving. So the Ishikawa diagram, inversion, and so forth. And just lastly, if you're trying to create something new, if you're trying to create a new system, you can use all sorts of interesting ways uh, to think that through. You can use connection circles, iceberg model, which is classically you have up on the top what you can see, but below are some of the root courses or abstractions. Um, you have feedback loops. Like there's some really cool stuff there that you can use and you can really focus on you know, the idea of parts versus the whole, that's another great systems one. So there you've got it, Mark. I mean, we could literally just go on for hours and mapping all the different models, but here's what we all need to know. There's essentially a category of three. You are generally applying a model for either problem solving, decision-making, or designing a new system. Like already there, that is such a breakthrough. And I mean, I've only spent a few years with this body of work and I love this because for me, it is the capacity to think clearer. And I think when we think clearer, we make better decisions where we walk away from wishful thinking and we just make wise, good decisions. We build good products. We solve complex problem, problems by making things simple. I mean, it feels good even talking about it, doesn't it, Mark? Yeah. I mean, you've already helped me um, compartmentalize and maybe even filter some of the mental models that we've discussed on the show so far, as well as the much wider ones that we've referenced and, and spoken about and understanding how to choose the right one, depending on the certain situation, decision-making versus problem solving and so on. That's already helping me and hopefully our listeners determine which model to try and choose and experiment with in a certain situation in life. Mm, fantastic stuff. Now we've still got some, um, some advice from Charlie Munger, we've got the chance to think about thinking, to build our Swiss army knife of mental models. Mark, where do we continue this journey? Well, similar, Mike, to where you were just taking us with really thinking about things in a different way and applying some of these models into actuality. This next clip we've got from Mr. Charlie Munger is all about considering our human condition and instead applying a little uncommon sense. The topic I'd like to talk about briefly is common sense. Which isn't common. Yes. <laughs> See? <laughs> <laughs> and what people mean when they say a man has common sense is uncommon sense. 
And usually they don't mean that the man has a narrow little activity he's good at, like knitting sweaters, and he sticks to that. What they mean is a man that can operate over a pretty broad range of, of human territory without making any big boners. And that is a very important thing to be, be good at. And the question is how you get it. I was very lucky in my own life because every place I looked, at the pinnacle, there was a guy that was better than I was. And my father, one of my father's best friends was a great surgeon with a vast mechanical ability. And I knew what this man did with his mechanical abilities and in inventing all these spreaders and things he used to do his operation. But I would never be as good as he was. And everywhere I looked, there was somebody like that. And there was all this folly out there. And I suddenly realized, like, if I just avoid all the folly, you know, maybe I can get an advantage without having to be really good at anything. And I kept <laughs> doing that all my life, and it worked so well that I, I, I enjoy sharing it with people like you. Yeah, you know, this is really interesting for me, Matt, because it's almost like if you keep in mind that humans are, on average, going to make some silly mistakes in decisions or solving problems because they haven't thought about it properly. It's like, um, it's like a warning sign, like keep in mind, like humans can make some pretty silly decisions. So you need to step back and think different before just jumping in there because the odds are humans won't do such a great job on the thinking, right? Yeah. This, this is a, a model that I think has benefited from Charlie because it contextualizes the fact that mistakes do happen. And instead of following uh, what other people or, or maybe his competitors or, or people out in, in the wide world would say, oh, just just use your common sense, just do this. And the truth is following common sense is, is uncommon. And in doing so, applying uncommon sense is common sense because everything is so unknown. You know, it's a, it's a kind of self-repeating cycle, isn't it? Mm. It really is. And, and I think what you see now is a bit of a pattern emerging is almost if you want to think better, you need to ask better questions. You need to step back and really ask, okay, what is the best way to think about this before you just launch in and think about it? Wouldn't you say, isn't that like the meta learning here? Yeah, the meta learning is exactly that. So try and in order to help yourself learn, in order to help apply these different models and these different frameworks to problem solving, decision making, leadership challenges, applying that uncommon sense approach is how you can think about things differently. And that's really what we're trying to go down into in this mental model series, Mike. We want to apply different thinking so we don't reach that plateau that we mm. were talking about earlier in the show. Mm. And it's so funny because I think by nature, in the first half of my career, I was so rash and zesty and speedy and wanted to be like dynamic. But isn't it funny how just pausing a moment to think first about how you're going to approach something before you jump in, how great is it to hear someone of Charlie Munger's status and accomplishments is crying out to us, ask better questions become a learning machine, find your method of learning, right? Build your Swiss army knife. And there is a pinnacle question mark at the highest order of him giving us advice on thinking better. And I think we better share this with the listeners. What do you think? That's right. This next clip, Mike, and all about thinking differently and applying um, these models into our life is going back to that most important and intelligent questions. We've got the Swiss, Swedish investor telling us now Charlie Munger's most intelligent question. We all have a built-in curiosity in us. When we were younger, we kept asking life's most important question. Why? Why are the dinosaurs gone? Why do people get sick? Why does Pete have more toys than me? Of course, what he's saying there, when he talks about why, that's the most important question of all, and it doesn't apply just to investment that applies to the whole human experience. If you want to get smart, the question you got to keep asking is why? Why, why, why? Perhaps we were too often told, because mommy and daddy say so. 
Understanding be damned. Just stop bothering me. But it is a terribly important question. Try to get that kid's cast of mind back. Try to figure out why things are happening or why they are not happening. Because over time, such information will help you grasp reality better. Within statistics, people sometimes throw out the so-called outliers, the results that you didn't expect to get and that diverge a lot from the rest of the data. What you want to do if you want to understand reality is probably the exact opposite of that. Study the outliers and ask why. How did they end up here? Why did Warren Buffett become the richest investor of all time? Why was my uncle forced to file for personal bankruptcy? Why is Coke probably the most consumed product in the world? Why was Enron able to cook its financial books and fool the investing community for so long? I mean, the idea of picking some extreme example and asking my favorite question, which is, what in hell is going on here? (laughs) That is the, the way to wisdom in this world. Why, oh why, oh why, Mark? I can tell you, from personal experience, I do think why is such a powerful question. It might remind you that Toyota has this philosophy of ask why five times and you'll get to the root cause of any problem. I believe this is so, so good because if you really ask why and then ask it again and again, you inevitably get to the heart of the matter, don't you? It's simple, but if done correctly, it's profound, isn't it? Well, Albert Einstein called it out in our show on him uh, in number 137 as well, this idea of persistence and sustained thinking. He always famously said, it's not that I'm so smart, it's that I just stay with problems longer. Stay with the problem longer and keep on asking why. Much like your Toyota example, how many times do they ask why? Is it seven? (laughs) They ask it five. I mean, how many times do you reckon Einstein asked why? Well, he famously would spend 95% of the time on the problem and only 5% on the solution. So I think he spent a lot of time asking Charlie Munger's favorite question of why. He did indeed. And listen, to bring us home on this uh, rip-roaring adventure into a lattice work of mental models, the thinking of Charlie Munger, the thinking about thinking, it would only be appropriate seeing as Berkshire Hathaway, Hathaway is so powerful as in a case of a timeless, great company that he is joined by Mr. Warren Buffett and we can listen to Charlie Munger talking about why life is too short. Uh, what are the most effective techniques you've used to minimize the mistakes? We made mistakes, we'll make more mistakes. We do, we think not so much, we we think in terms of not exposing ourselves to any mistakes that could really hurt our ability to play tomorrow. And and so we are always thinking about, you know, worst case situations. And uh, there are, on the other hand, we have a natural instinct to do things big, both of us. Uh, So we have to uh, think about whether we're doing anything really big that could have really terrible consequences. And, and uh, uh, I would say this, that A, I don't worry much about mistakes. I mean, the idea of learning from mistakes, the next mistake is something different. I mean, so I, I, I do not sit around and think about my mistakes and think about things I'm going to do differently in the future or anything of the sort. I would say that the you may get some advantage. I think I've learned something over the years. Uh, I haven't learned more about a basic investment philosophy. I got that when I was 19 and I still I, I think I've learned more about people uh, over the years and uh, I'll make mistakes with people on, uh, you know, that's inevitable. But I think uh, I'll make more good judgments about people. Uh, I'll recognize the extraordinary ones better than I would have 40 or 50 years ago. So I, I, I think that improves, but I don't think it improves by certainly any conscious sitting around and focusing on what mistake that I make with that person or this person. I, I just don't operate that way. Charlie? Well, Warren, I would argue that, that what you've done and what I've done to a lesser extent is to learn a lot from other people's mistakes. 
that is really a much more pleasant way to learn hard lessons. <laughs> and, and we have really worked at that over the years, partly because we find it so interesting, the great variety of human mistakes and their causes. And I think this constant study of other people's disasters and other people's errors has helped us enormously. Don't you, Warren? Oh, yeah. Well, that's true. In terms of reading of financial I've always been absolutely absorbed with reading about disasters. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and there's no question. I mean, when you look at the folly of, of humans, uh, you know, I've focused on the folly in the financial area. There's all kinds of folly elsewhere. But, but just the financial area will give you plenty of material if you like to be a follower of folly. And uh, uh, I, I do think that understanding and that's what gave us some advantage over these people that had IQs of 180, you know, and, and could do things with math that we couldn't do. They just, they really just didn't have an understanding of, of how human beings behaved and, and, and what happens. Uh, 2008 was a good example of that, too. And so we've, uh, we've been a, we have been a student of other people's, of other people's folly, and, and, uh, and it served us well. The man, Mr. Charlie Munger, as well as his co-partner in crime, Mr. Warren Buffett, who, Mike, we actually did in episode 44 as well. The mm. two of them coming together to close out the show is really the perfect summation of learning, of applying different models, but also this idea of following the mistakes or disasters, I guess you could call it, or the folly mm. of others so that you can continually learn. I mean, how powerful is that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's almost the, the active inversion where you say, if I know what I need to do to be successful, what do I want to avoid? Um, you know, if I was going to be unsuccessful, what would be the worst things that could happen? You know, your company would run out of money, the product would suck, there would be like, you can literally learn from the mistakes of others. And I think that's, you know, if this got to be close to one of the highest values here on the Moonshots podcast that we see across all of the superstars, that they seem to embrace failure and ask themselves, what did I learn about it if I did it? Or what we see from uh, Charlie Munger, he's looking at others going, oh, they did that bad move make sure, note to self, we won't do that. And you can see how the, they're often talking about circle of competence. The reason that he didn't invest in some companies is because they didn't understand them. So they weren't prepared to risk their money where a lot of other people make foolish investments that hurt them. These guys stick to what they know. They learn from others' mistakes. And that's why, I mean, you want a crazy stat like if you think about what these guys have achieved. So if you take 99 through to 2020, so over that 20-year period, their company outperformed the stock market 12 out of the 20 years and nobody else is close to them. They know what they know. They keep learning new models for new decades and new times and they are great students. What did, what did Buffett call it? They are followers of folly. Followers of folly. I mean, what an amazing achievement to beat the S&P 500. Wow. They, they just were on another level. So maybe, Mike, we can leave today's show absorbing this information from Charlie Munger and maybe we can, with our small team of moonshotters, get to the, <laughs> get to the numbers that Berkshire Hathaway have achieved over their lifetime as well. I think so. Now, we covered a lot of ground uh, today. What what's the what's the standout for you? What what's going to get a little bit more consideration and research from you, Mike? Yep, I think it's really about this Swiss Army knife approach. So don't try and fit mm. life's problems around my experience, the knowledge that I have. Don't try and hammer in the problem with a with a, a you know hammer approach, and instead think how else might I be able to solve this? What else can I learn to make this problem that little bit easier or a little bit more efficient to go and solve? Mm. That Swiss Army knife approach from Charlie Munger is, is what's sticking out for me, Mike. What about yourself? 
Well, I just wanted to ask, so you think the conversation where we were talking about like the different types of models, like there's models for decision-making, models for problem-solving, is that the kind of, oh, wow, it's, I've got like a whole toolbox? That's exactly it. Think about the toolbox that I can carry around in my head and yeah. access, filter, go through, compartmentalize and consider the situation I've got right now. Okay, I need to make a tough decision. How am I going to do that? Let me look at my repertoire of models that I have that might be well suited for problem solving. Now yeah. I'll dive in. And is, it's a crazy that thought because I've had a similar aha uh -huh, because I was just intuitively just for most of my life trying to solve problems with the logic that I had, whether it be good or bad or otherwise, I just jumped in and thought. And isn't it crazy when you think, oh, I can think about thinking. Well, am I solving a problem or making a decision or am I designing a system here? What am I actually trying to do? How, how best should I think about this? Isn't that a crazy moment? It, it, yeah. The, the, the aha moment of thinking, why would I only utilize the knowledge I've learned in a set period of time and try and apply it against all of life's problems and instead right. think every day, every minute, 1% better. These are things that I can learn. These are things that I can utilize in my toolbox to go and set about challenging those, those uh, problems. Mm. It just makes so much sense, doesn't it, Mike? <laughs> it does, but it's, it's sometimes a bit scary. Like, how long have I lived my life not thinking about mental models? <laughs> if, if, I was, if I was tougher myself, I would probably say the majority so far. But I'm glad the mental model series has set me on the right path. Yeah, it really, really, I've got the same feeling about it. So Mark, thank you to you and thank you to you, our listeners, all of the moonshotters who are out there learning out loud with Mark and myself, trying to be the best version of yourselves. Welcome to the family and a special welcome to our members who signed up via Patreon. You are deep in this journey with us. And today the journey was with Charlie Munger, from Berkshire Hathaway, a man who's dedicated a lifetime to learning and to acquiring wisdom. He made the case that it's essential. He helped us understand that we need to become a learning machine and we have to think about the thinking. We have to learn about the learning. We have to have a method of learning so we can build a Swiss army nice of mental models. And with that, we'll go out in a very uncommon way and we will understand that it is uncommon sense that will help us overcome ignorance and stupidity. And the biggest weapon of them all is the most intelligent question you can ever ask, why? And if you ask why, you too can go out and be the best version of yourselves. Maybe, like Charlie Munger, you'll be Batman and Robin with your Warren Buffett because together we can be better and together we can all become the best versions of ourselves. We can learn from the mistakes of others and put our best foot forward. All right, that's it for the Moonshots podcast. That's a wrap.